delighted to be uh, uh, able to talk to you. My name's uh, uh, Pankaj Sharma. I'm Professor of Neurology at uh, Royal Holloway College, which is uh, in the University of London. So I've been given a, a slightly unusual brief. I, to be honest, I didn't quite understand the title, and that's why I didn't put the title up on the slide, because I didn't understand it. But I, I'm meant to be able to talk to you about research, physiological research. I'm not quite sure what that is, so I thought I'd just make it up and talk to you about the kind of research that's going on, some of which has already delivered subject, some of which have already rather delivered stuff, others that is in progress, and others that are maybe a little bit more in the future. So um, I, I, I'm going to speak about half an hour, 40, 35, 40 minutes, but I wanted more time for questions, because uh, I think we've been given an hour. So uh, I'll, I'll kick off if I may. I always like start with this slide. Uh, who's, who's the person in the your top left-hand corner? Churchill, the one in the middle. Sorry? Nehru, very good. First Prime Minister of Independent India. The top right. Nixon and Elvis. Yeah, the king of rock and roll. That's actually quite an important picture, actually. That's, the, that's uh, when uh, the king of rock and roll first met uh, uh, Nixon. Uh, and uh, Nixon is the person we're interested in this particular photograph. They used to call him, I think, Tricky Dicky, didn't they? So you never believed a word he ever said, apparently. And uh, who's the guy in the family photograph right in the middle, the old man? Kennedy. Kennedy, very good. Yeah, most people don't get that, actually. Very good. Yeah, that's Joseph Kennedy. That's uh, the entire Kennedy clan. And that picture was taken, I think, just prior to his appointment as US ambassador to London. And then uh, in, the top, in the bottom right is, is Thatcher, of course, telling us she's won her third term. I'm not quite sure why there's a monkey and a donkey in the background. <laughs> but if, uh, <laughs> if anybody can answer that, I'd be, re I'd be really please, because I've used that photograph a couple of times over the years. Um, so it'll come as no surprise to you that all of these famous figures have uh, 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 either had a stroke or died from a stroke. And really, the, the, the point of showing you that is that stroke is a global phenomenon. It's no respecter of social class, creed, race, or religion. And in the UK, it consumes about 7% of the entire NHS budget. Uh, and uh, that's the instance rate there. In America, it's even bigger, as you can imagine. It uh, affects about half a million people a year. And it consumed last year, I think, in fact, that slide's wrong. It consumed last year seven, uh, um, uh, $70 billion. Uh, so it is a huge business. And what really, what is a stroke? Well, uh, you're all familiar with this, but the vast majority of strokes are uh, uh, relate to plaques that are abnormal tissues or clots building up inside the blood vessels. And the blood vessels, as you can see, as they, 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 uh, uh, um, oh, it's a shame I don't have a pointer, but uh, the blood vessels, as you can see, uh, they, they get, they get uh, more and more clumped, and then they block up the artery, and that's essentially what causes a stroke. And this is really what the consequence of all of that is. And here on, the, on your left-hand side, you can see an MRI brain scan. And the brain scan shows lots of white stuff inside the brain, which shouldn't be there. And that is the consequence of an ischemic infarct, which is basically a clot in the brain. And all of that white stuff in the brain, on that half of the brain, shows that that part of the brain has died. And that's what's caused the stroke and that will result in paralysis on the opposite side because this part of the brain supplies this part of the, the body and this part of the brain controls this part of the body. So it's the opposite side. And this is the pathology. This patient unfortunately passed away. And this is the pathology. You can see that there's a lot of black around the brain which is bleeding. Even though this is an infarct, it's a clot, the clot has started to bleed inside because it's such a friable, sponge-like tissue and all of that has, uh, has eventually read, led, unfortunately, to this patient passing away. But So that's, that's, I just wanted to set the scene that this is the kind of thing what we're going to be talking about. So this will come as no surprise to any of you. What are the commonest causes for having a stroke? And by far the commonest cause. So uh, by age is by far the biggest cause for uh, a stroke as you get older. And this, this picture actually puts it into perspective for you. So which ev with every 10 years of life, your chances of having a stroke in the normal population increases. So you can do pretty much anything you like in your 20s and 30s. But by the time you get to your 40s, you want, you want to start living a bit, um, uh, uh, mon uh, bit like a mon monastically, really, in a monastery, really. Because, because the, after your 40s and 50s, almost anything that you do increases your risk of having a stroke, as you can see there. And, and then the, the other big causes, of course, is high blood pressure 
and, uh, and atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, and I'm going to come back to both of those as well. And there's a whole list of other things as well, none of which will, will surprise you. So what, what, why do we age, by the way? If age is the biggest cause for stroke, it's interesting, isn't it? What makes us age? Uh, not every, every species in the world ages, uh, but the humans, along with the vast majority of mammals, of course, almost all mammals age, but there are some fish that don't age, jellyfish kind of things. But, but this, this, uh, there, there's a variety of reasons why people age, and one of the biggest reasons that people have researched in recent times is what's called telomeres. Now, in your genes, in your chromosomes that you've all got, the end, how does a chromosome know that I've come to the end? The gene has come to the end of its bit, that, all right, that's it, I'm, I'm done now. So at the end of it, there's a finishing bit that called a telomere. And as you get older, the telomeres are really long things, okay? And as you get older, those telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's, it's hypothesized. And these telomeres are represented by those white dots at the end of each of those chromosomes. So, so that's how the chromosome knows that I've now come to the end of my chromosome because of that telomere, it's like a finishing, it's like a barrier. And that long barrier gets shorter and shorter and shorter with every year that goes on. And people have uh, hypothesized, and there's lots of research, I can't bore you with the details, but they've hypothesized that as those telomeres get shorter, and they're present in all cells, as they get shorter and shorter, the cell knows that it's aging, and then as it gets really short, that's when the cell dies, and ultimately the human body then passes away. And that's why there's an there's a approximately inbuilt, inherent biological clock within all of us that says we'll all die around 100 years old or 120 years old. It's going to be really difficult to live longer than 120 years because those telomeres have come to uh, the end of their, their, uh, uh, their life. They've become so short. And this, uh, this uh, sort of revolving picture shows you what a telomere looks like. It's, sort of, it's not long, it's all wrapped up and curled up, and, uh, and it'll get shorter and shorter and shorter. And what researchers have recently thought is, well, if, if uh, aging causes telomeres to get shorter, are there any ways we can make it longer, i.e. delay the shortening that occurs? And in fact, people have done that now. They've done it in animals, in rats, and what they found is uh, what they found is that the rats live longer uh, and they look younger as well if you can increase the length of their telomeres. So if stroke is an age-related disorder, which it is, because it mostly happens in, uh, as you get older, if we can prevent the telomeres from getting shorter as quickly as they normally do, or indeed if we can get them to become longer, reverse the process, it's entirely then now poss potentially possible to delay aging and therefore delay the onset of stroke. And in fact, this is such an interesting and important idea that the three people that thought of it and discovered telomeres won the Nobel Prize uh, because uh, the Nobel Committee thought that this potentially could become a really big thing as the years go on. And interestingly, you, you know when you look at someone who's been smoking all of their lives, they smoke 80 cigarettes a day and they get to the age of 40 years old, and their skin tends to look a little bit, I don't know, a little bit craggier. Uh, they've, 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 they've had a good life, so to speak, and they're, 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 their skin just doesn't look as young as someone of equal age but who hasn't smoked. If you look at their telomeres, their telomeres are shorter, the length of their telomeres shorter, compared to someone who doesn't smoke, suggesting that their body is aging faster because they're smoking. And the same applies to people who drink lots of alcohol. If you drink lots of alcohol, your telomeres get shorter, which suggests that your body's aging faster than it ought to. So it's a really important concept, and I say such an important concept that the, uh, the uh, investigators won the Nobel Prize. And so lots of people are now working on potentially coming up with drugs that actually sh that slow the progress of shortening of telomeres. So I thought that might be of some interest to you. So the, the other thing I thought I'd, I'd mention what's happening in research nowadays is, uh, and this has actually delivered something, and many of you will know about this already, is atrial fibrillation. It's a very common cause of stroke. It's when the heart doesn't beat uh, as normally as it should do. It beats irregularly, and because it beats irregularly, it allows a clot to form in the heart, and therefore that clot can fly off into the, uh, into the brain, causing a stroke. And we know that those people who have atrial fibrillation are five times more likely to have a stroke compared to those who don't have atrial fibrillation. 
And we know also they're twice as likely to die if they have atrial fibrillation compared to those that don't. So what do, uh, and it's really prevalent, by the way, it's prevalent as you get older, it becomes more and more common, particularly in the elderly, and also as the years, as the population ages, in uh, more and more people living longer, it's becoming more and more prevalent in the population. So more and more people have got atrial fibrillation. And so what uh, uh, we know is that uh, we give people warfarin, so this is rat poison, and it's pretty, it's really good stuff actually for atrial fibrillation. It stops you from having strokes uh, uh, and, and heart problems with atrial fibrillation. The problem is, however, that those people who we put on warfarin have a much higher instance of bleeding because we're thinning the blood really powerfully. They have a much higher instance of bleeding compared to those that aren't on warfarin. But we have to give warfarin because they're in atrial fibrillation and they've got a five times ch higher chance of having a stroke. So that's what we've done. But what, uh, uh, what we also know is that those people on warfarin, they have to have regular blood tests. And those blood tests are called uh, INR. You have to measure your INR. And the INR has to be in a really tight window of between two and three. Uh, and, it, and you just look at the bottom left-hand graph there. That column shows you that it has to be in that small window of between two and three. And if it isn't in that small window, if it goes to the left, if you have less than two, your blood test for warfarin, then you're going to have a, a higher chance of having a stroke because you're not, you're not thinning the blood enough. Or if it goes above three, then you've got a higher chance of having a stroke because you're going to bleed because you've got too much thin blood. So it's really difficult to get warfarin levels quite right. And so what lots of investigators have done, they came up with a, a bunch of new tablets which have been launched in the market a couple of years now. And this is the culmination of about 15 years' worth of research. And these drugs, and I shan't bother you with the, the names of them, but there's more coming onto the market this year as well as next year. Uh, these are now going to be replacing warfarin. And there's no doubt in my mind that in the next 10 years or so, warfarin is going to become obsolete because of these drugs. And the beauty of these drugs is that they, you just take them once or twice a day, and there's no blood tests that are required. So you don't need to measure your INR and we don't need to worry that sometimes you're going to be out of range or in range or sometimes lower than range because these, these uh, uh, drugs don't need any monitoring at all. So, that's an so telomeres is an example of something that is going to be occurring maybe towards the end of my life or something. But these, this kind of research has actually already now delivered, although it's taken 10 or 15 years to get here. So what, what do we do with dealing with clots once they're already formed? What's the kind of stuff that's going on now in terms of research? Well, this is the, the kind of complicated imaging scans that we can do uh, to determine whether people have had a, a clot. And uh, uh, lots of, uh, I don't expect you to interpret this, but it just shows the kind of detailed imaging that is now available uh, at our disposal uh, in uh, in. Uh, 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 in, in, in large hospitals. And the blue area on this brain scan shows the cold area in the brain where this clot it has blocked the blood supply getting to the brain. And that's why it's turning blue, whereas all the uh, multicolored stuff is all nice hot red blood circulating. So this person, we would predict, is going to have a large stroke because that's quite a large amount of blue on the left-hand side of that brain scans, those four brain scans of the same, same person. It's quite a lot of blue around there. So this person is going to not do very well if we don't intervene very quickly. And uh, uh, you probably can't see this, but, but uh, uh, this is more detailed imaging that we can do. We can identify the clot. We can see where it is. And normally what we've done is we've gone in and uh, we've either given intravenous clot-busting drugs, i.e. we put it through the arm and it circulates all over the blood body. The problem with doing that, of course, is that the clot is in the brain, but we've given blood thinning, powerful blood thinning clot-busting drugs, which is circulating all over the body, and that could have consequences that we may not be able to predict. So we only really want it in there. So the other thing that we can do is actually go in, and we do do this now, we do this about once a week now, we can go in, into the arteries in the brain itself and then inject directly into the clot itself the clot busting drug so we don't need now to just put it into the arms and hope that you know part of it's going to get to the brain we actually go into uh, uh, the clot itself and inject directly there and so that's what we're doing now okay 
And in the last few months, uh, there's been a lot of research that's been published, which is going to change our practice this year as well as next year and, on, and onwards from there. And that research suggests that it's even better to not just squirt some clot-busting drugs into the clot itself, it's actually even better to go in and take the clot out completely, but mechanically. You don't need to inject anything, just go in to pick the clot and take it out. And that's what we do. And at the bottom picture, you can see that's the kind of uh, a tube that we can get go into the brain itself, the blood vessel in the brain. We go past the clot, okay, we go through, we drill through the clot, we then open up a microscopic umbrella, and then we pull the tube back out again. And as the umbrella has opened up, it drags the clot all the way back out again. And it's been shown now in uh, publications, uh, research that's been published in the last few months, that that actually has an even better outcome compared to squirting clot-busting drugs inside the body. And, and my, uh, uh, you, you can quote me on this because I think in the next couple of years, so very short time scale, you'll find that this kind of mechanical going in, taking the clot out physically itself, is going to revolutionize the management of, uh, of acute stroke. And actually, that would make sense, wouldn't it? If you've, got a, if you've got a blockage in the plumbing of your central heating system, what you don't tend to do, you don't squirt more and more stuff into it. You get a plumber, and he goes in, and he takes the, clock out, he takes the block out, and then the plumbing works again. And actually, the circulation in the brain is no different from that in that you go in, it's better to just take the physically take the clot out. So that's a, a research that's just been published in the last month or two, and it's going to, uh, my guess is, it's going to revolutionise that. Yeah. How, how long um, would this need to be done after signs of So that's an excellent question. So those who didn't hear, it's uh, a, a, how much time do we have uh, to go in to do this before, uh, uh, following the onset of symptoms, I'm guessing, yeah? So, so we, we, in clot-busting drugs, we have about four, four and a half hours to get the, the, the clot-busting drugs into the body. With this, it looks like the time scale we have is longer. So it may actually be six hours, so it may actually give us more opportunity to treat patient, and I suspect in certain blood vessels of the brain, we may even be able to extend that to 10 or 12 hours. So it looks like we'll be able to treat many more people. Now, of course, the consequence of that is that hospitals have to readjust their systems, that you know, we'll have more people rushing into to, to hospital. Uh, but that's good, because it means we'll be able to save more people. But it does mean you know, the politicians will have to argue amongst themselves about the cost of doing that and providing enough beds and so on and so forth. But from my point of view, I think this is great. Yeah? Sorry, yeah. Sure. You're saying that strokes is age-related, the mm -hmm. older you get. How can you explain that more young people are having strokes these days? Okay, so that's a very good question. So my particular interest actually is young stroke. That's what I, I particularly do. So uh, my definition of young has changed as I get older. Uh, so so <laughs> it used to be like 20. <laughs> <Now it's laughs> so, so my definition of young now is 50. Um, uh, uh, and I run a, one of the few young stroke clinics in the country, so I see people under the age of 50, quite a lot of people under the age of 50. And I know there's been lots of reports that young people are getting more and more stroke. It's more prevalent in, 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 uh, in younger people. Now, now, there are a variety of reasons to account for that. Some of them may well be that stroke is occurring more often in younger people. Maybe they're not doing enough exercise, maybe they're eating the wrong food, uh, and so stroke is becoming more prevalent, as you quite rightly say. Or alternatively, it may be that stroke is being diagnosed better yes. in those, those, uh, that group. Whereas before, a generation before me, the doctors would have thought, oh, we don't know what's wrong with that 30-year-old that patient's arm, but it can't be a stroke, and we've got no brain scans to prove it anyway, because CT scanning only came in the 1980s and MRI in the 1990s. So we, we, we didn't actually know some neurologist like me would come along and come up with some fancy diagnosis and no one would be able to prove him or her wrong. But you're saying it could be lifestyle with young people. It may well be lifestyle. How come babies and, and young children and toddlers have strokes? 
right? So babies and young toddlers have strokes for completely different reasons. So they tend to be uh, causes that are related to the blood that they have themselves. So they tend to have sticky blood or they've been born with abnormal blood vessels themselves. And that's why stroke in children is almost completely different from stroke in adults from the age of 16 or 18 onwards. So that's why, okay? So, and in fact, coming on from your point of view, your uh, question, why young people have stroke, one of my particular interests is genetics. And maybe genes account for some people that have stroke. Yeah. Is there really a mechanism that is passed through their into one eye and then that's the cause of an Right, so, so a bleed accounts for about 15%, so just over 1 in 10, 2 in 10 of strokes. And, and the one that you're talking about, the aneurysm, is a weakening in the artery, and that weakening has resulted in a ballooning of the artery, and at some point the balloon has just ruptured and the blood has leaked out. And so that's an aneurysm that's, that uh, has burst. And obviously, it's not due to a clot, so we wouldn't go in to give either clot-busting drugs because that would make it worse, or we wouldn't go in to remove a clot because there isn't one. So the management is slightly different there. I have to say, I have to be honest, that more of the research has been done on the clotting side of the stroke uh, uh, fence rather than the bleeding side of the stroke fence. And partly, I think that's related because the vast majority of strokes are in the clotting edge on the clotting end. But having said that, there, are, there, is, there is quite a lot of research going on on the bleeding side in that they're coming up with drugs to try and stop bleeds from occurring once they've, once they've started. So there are those kind of drugs, and some of them are going to trial at the moment. Okay? Uh, so bleeding may well be just a rupture of the artery. So once the rupture, it, artery, then it leaks out. Oh, no, so genetics may well be one of the causes. You may actually be uh, uh, prone to have a bleed, uh, or alternatively, you may have some trauma. So many of you may know that uh, 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 Andrew Marr, the, the journalist, uh, had, a, had, a, uh, had a stroke, and he, he had a bit of trauma from the, one of the neck arteries, which caused him to have a stroke. So if you, if you exert yourself too much sometimes, and that can rupture an artery. But usually you have to have weakness in the artery beforehand. Otherwise, you know, all these Olympic athletes would all be starting to have strokes. So normally you have to be, have some sort of weakness there. Okay? Yeah. You can pull the mat, pull it out. Uh, uh, sorry, you, you have to have... You straight in and pull it out. Yes. Yeah, so you have to have the clock there. Then you can go in and then... Put the umbrella up and then scrape it out. So you don't have to have the clot busting drug first. Uh, you, you, we tend to give the drug busting drug first because it makes it easier to take the clot out. But that's not the. But we're not actually expecting the clot busting drug to dissolve the clot because within a few minutes we'll have taken the clot out anyway. But it just makes it a bit more easy to take out. Mm, okay. Thank you. So let's just uh, uh, talk a bit about the the genetic side of things and how does genes play a role in stroke particularly young stroke, actually. So if you look at this curve, it's like, an, it's like a sort of a, an umbrella curve, isn't it? And they're, they're, you can imagine that, that uh, say you're talking about blood pressure, some people are on one end of this curve, they have high blood pressure. Other people on the other end of the curve, they have low blood pressure. But quite a lot of people are, like, you know, most of us in the audience are likely to be in the middle somewhere. Uh, and how do genes influence this? Well, it, underlying this, this uh, observed blood pressure that we all see, there may be a gene like CB, which sits on the edge, which controls, which is responsible for high blood pressure. Alternatively, gene A may be on that side, which is responsible for low blood pressure, and there'll be a variety of other genes in the middle. So what we try and do, some, one of my big interests, is try and dissect out all of these genes that contribute to what we see, which is the whole range of blood pressure. Okay? And the same applies for stroke as well. Large strokes, small strokes, most of them are going to be in the middle somewhere. And what we've done in, in, uh, quite recently in the last couple of years is identified some genes for stroke. And these genes may well account for stroke in the younger population. And the top six genes, the, 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 don't, don't worry about most of the, you, you won't be able to read it all, but we've essentially identified about half a dozen genes that we think are accounted for stroke. And we've actually gone on to prove 
that these are actually not just associated with stroke, but these are actually responsible for causing stroke. And we reckoned about, in our, in our research we, we published, we reckoned about a third of all strokes in America may well have been caused by these six genes alone. Okay, so it's quite an important piece of work. Now, you could say, well, all right, that's very interesting, but how does that relate to anything that we, we do at the moment in terms of drugs uh, or in terms of management of stroke? Well, this is an interesting piece of uh, research that you might, might uh, uh, find, uh, find uh, intriguing. So most of you will be on aspirin, okay, or an aspirin-like drug, a plate, antiplatelet drug, and it works most of the time. But in some of the time, it doesn't work. People on aspirin still go on to get a stroke, okay? And that's the, in blue, you can see that there is, as time goes on, some people do go on to have a stroke, despite being on what we think is a pretty good drug for preventing aspirin. Now, there could be a variety of reasons why people go on to have a stroke, despite being on aspirin. One, they may, compliance might be an issue. They may not be taking the drug. Uh, yeah, you're taking the drug, oh yeah, doc, I take it every single day. And then you look at the tablet box and it's still full. So, you know, the people sometimes just don't forget, they forget to take the drug, they don't like taking drugs, whatever, that could be a reason. Or, you know, we may have got the dose wrong or whatever. So there are a whole variety of lists there that of why sometimes uh, aspirin doesn't work. But one of them at the bottom is it could be genetic. So we thought about whether it could be a genetic problem. And what we did, we did a trial, don't, don't worry about the slide, but we did a trial. We recruited 100 medical students and uh, we measured, we did a whole load of blood tests on them for looking at platelets, which is what aspirin works against. So we did a whole load of platelet studies on them. Then a week later, we repeated all those studies. We didn't do anything to the, to the medical students, we just repeated them. We wanted to make sure that we got stability, so within a week that things didn't change. And then after the week, we gave them uh, 100 milligrams uh, of aspirin, and then after about a month or so, oh sorry, 300 milligrams of aspirin, then after about a month or so, we repeated those platelet studies with them. And this is what we found. So remember the first week we didn't do anything, we did the blood test, and as you can see, everything was stable on the left-hand side, everything was stable, and then we gave them 300 milligrams of aspirin, and then within a month, their platelet function plummeted. It went really down, which is what you'd expect aspirin to do, because it's an antiplatelet, yeah? So their platelet function plummeted. But three of those guys, three of our medical students, nothing happened to them, despite us giving them th normal individuals, normal 20-year-olds, 300 milligrams of aspirin, not a blind bit of difference to their platelets. Okay, that's quite a large dose, 300 milligrams. And we did lots of tests on, them, on, on all of these 100 people, and, and those three were consistently, so to speak, abnormal in terms of their response to aspirin. And we proved that they were taking the aspirin. Okay, so uh, it couldn't have been that they weren't taking it. And so what we did, we, we identified, we went and did a genome study on them. We identified a gene that all three of them had, and, and this is the kind of pretty pictures that you get after genetics. And we identified a gene that they had, which was a variant to all the other 97 people. So three, three of them had a gene that made them resistant to aspirin. Okay, so that's a very important study, which means that potentially 3% of all the people we're giving aspirin to isn't working because they were born not to have aspirin because of their genetic profile, okay? And so then we thought, well, that's a bit of a problem. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're missing 3% of the entire population here. So what we did, we did another study. We took their blood, okay? We put it in a little dish, and then we gave, put an aspirin tablet on it, okay? And we, sit, we wanted to see what effect it would have on their platelets. And then what we did, we, we gradually increased the dose of the aspirin tablet we put on the dish. So we went from 50 to 100 to 300 to 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams. And then eventually what we found was that we got to a dose where we overcame that genetic resistance. Okay? So what this important study shows that we're potentially missing 3% of the population out there who aren't meant to have aspirin, even though we prescribe it to them, it, it, it ain't working, but actually, we can overcome that by giving them a higher dose, okay? We can, we can flood the system so that it actually overcomes their genetic resistance. But of course, that does mean that there's gonna be potentially side effects of the aspirin, you're gonna get gut problems potentially, but at least it shows that even if you do have a genetic basis for some things, we potentially can overcome it, not, not by, uh, you know, we, we don't give up, at least we can overcome it by it potentially increasing the dose, all right? 
but, but, but we don't actually test for genetic resistance to aspirin at the moment. This is a research that we've only just published, so uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty new at the moment. Sir? I'm on 75. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yes, that's absolutely normal. 75 milligrams is the, is the tested dose in all the trials, well, in all the European trials, but bear in mind that we think that there's, there's a group of people out there who are on that dose, who have got genetic aspirin resistance, in which case it's not likely to work, but we can't identify them yet because we don't, do, we don't offer genetic testing uh, to people at the moment. That's not very reassuring, <laughs> but, but bear, in mind that, that bear in mind, it worked in 97% of the medical students. Okay? So if you're a betting man and someone said, you're going to win the lottery and you've got a 97% chance of winning the lottery, you can bet your bottom dollar, none of you will be sitting in this room listening to me. You'd all be going out to buy a lottery ticket. Okay. <laughs> all right, so, so you've all heard a lot of uh, stuff in the television. Yeah, sorry. Okay, you can give greater doses of aspirin, but doesn't that cause failure of the kidneys and things like that? Yeah, so, so is it worth, you know, is all the aspirin worth the, af the side effects? Right, exactly. So, so what we were trying to prove was that we could overcome the genetic aspect of it. It wasn't to suggest that we should suddenly start giving people 1,000 milligrams of aspirin, but it was just to see whether we could overcome the genetics because it shows that in principle, we can overcome genetics by, by uh, not having to alter the genetic individual itself, not take, doing gene therapy or something like that, which would be a whole, whole problematic scenario. So we didn't want to go down that route, so we wanted to see whether we could do something practical. on aspirin have tests every year to make sure that the aspirin's not affect, sure. affecting all their organs. Sure. Well, I do anyway. Sure. Yeah, so right. they'd obviously have to keep an eye on everything, you're wouldn't quite they? Right, quite right. Yeah. Good. So you've heard a lot about uh, stem cell therapy potentially in the, in the news, and uh, we're one of the few centres that, that uh, uh, have been involved in stem cell therapy. I think there's only two centres in the country. Um, and uh, uh, you've seen this slide before. This is, this is what a, a potential stroke is going to look like. The blue area is the cold area. So this, this real patient came into us and uh, uh, was going to have a potentially pretty bad outcome, to be honest. And uh, uh, what we have been doing is be, been taking stem cells, CD34 they're called cells, from individuals themselves, the patient themselves, not, not some donor, but the patient themselves, we, we purify them to make sure we don't have any viruses or anything uh, other horrible stuff in, in there. And then what we have done, we've re-injected those newly purified stem cells that we got from the patient themselves, okay, and we've re-injected it directly into the brain. Okay? And uh, uh, here's an example. We've done it in about six people now. And here's an example of the outcome. So there's that patient on the top left-hand corner you can see that the white stuff, remember, is all the dying brain. And what we've done is uh, uh, we've injected the stem cells directly into the brain, in the arteries in the brain, and that's the bottom picture there. And this patient uh, uh, did extremely well, despite having what we would have predicted normally to be a pretty poor outcome. Now, before you all start saying, can we have stem cell therapy, I should say that it's only been done, we've, we've only done it in six people. The, the ethics approval that the government gave us to do this was purely to look at safety, all right? It wasn't to look uh, to see whether the outcome was going to be better or not. It was just to see, is it safe to do? So we've shown it was safe to do. But interestingly, of course, we, we, did, we didn't ignore the, the outcomes, but interestingly, we found that many of these six patients were actually improving functionally as well. But of course, that was not the purpose of the study. The government only gave us approval to do, to do the safety part of the study. So we've shown it's safe, and there was a tantalizing hint in only six people that actually stem cell therapy was able to improve their outcome. And the government only gave us the ethics to do this in particularly bad patients, okay? They weren't allowing us to do this in minor strokes. We had to do it in big strokes. So a functional recovery in a big stroke actually is, is quite an important outcome. And it potentially, it means that functional recovery in a smaller stroke could actually be 100% recovery. But I can't say that because I don't have the, I don't have the proof for it for you. But, but that was a certainly a tantalizing hint that we got from this early study that, we're, that we've just completed. Okay. 
So whilst I've, I've given you uh, uh, lots of information about all the fascinating things that are happening in uh, research, I didn't want to flood, flood, flood you. I want to have more time for questions if I can. So I've given you lots of information. It's really, really important to remember, you know, stem cells are, 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 are some 10, 20 years away. Uh, some of the telomere stuff may be 20, 30 years away. The really important thing at the moment is to make sure that you live a healthy lifestyle, keep the weight down, keep the cholesterol down, eat a good uh, diet, uh, don't smoke and reduce your alcohol intake and, and for goodness sake always get your blood pressure measured to make sure that your blood pressure is normal because blood pressure is the one thing we can do something about now. And the research on blood pressure in relation to stroke took place 40 years ago. So no doubt there was a guy standing up here 40 years ago talking about the new research in blood pressure and how that was going to revolutionise the management of stroke. And, it, and there's absolutely no doubt in the last 40 years we've proven time and time again that maintaining your blood pressure has by far the best outcome for stroke uh, in terms of prevention than any of the, the, the fancy stuff that I've been talking about. Okay. And so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all the people in my team without whom much of this research would never have been possible and also all the funding bodies uh, that have contributed to this. Okay, thank you very much. So I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So if any of you uh, have any further questions, I'd be happy to, to ask, answer them. Yeah, yep, that's good. Uh, you've, you've given us quite a few things that can cause or... Mm -hmm. contribute towards stroke, but you haven't mentioned the oral con or contraceptive or the HRT. Yeah, so, so there, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in stroke. Obviously, I, I, I didn't, didn't want to go to all of it, but there's no, question, there's no doubt that uh, the oral contraceptive pill, the combined oral contraceptive pill, which is estrogen and progesterone, has been associated with stroke, but the, the stroke risk is pretty small, to be honest, is really small. So that's why uh, we, we, we don't have too much of a problem with the oral contraceptive pill. The stroke risk increases with the pill slightly uh, if you have migraine, and the type of migraine that you have, uh, and including HRT, the type of migraine that you have has to be what we call classical migraine, i.e. you get flashing lights in front of your eyes, then you go on to get the headache. And it increases uh, even more, and slightly more dramatically, actually, with smoking. So if you smoke and take the pill or, or take HRT, that's a bad idea. Uh, I, mean, I have genetic, I've got a lot of genetics in my family. I think that's why I had a, I've never smoked in my life. I've never been overweight till now. Mm. I've always exercised, I've always had a good diet, but I still had a stroke because of the genetics. Mm. But I didn't know that HRT was a contributory factor until I went into hospital. It was all over the, the wards and everything. Yeah. And my doctor actually gave me HRT. She, sh she shouldn't have, but she did. So, and, um, so, so a HRT... She should have looked at my history, but they're not doing that. Sure. I mean, if I'd have known... If I'd have known it was a contributory factor, knowing my, my history, my family history, I would never have taken the yeah. drug. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. And I said to the doctor, I said, what side effects does it give you? Or she said, I could sit here for hours telling the side effects. You'll have to read the instructions. I mean, that's not good enough, is it? Right, so, so HRT has been associated with stroke, but I have to say the risk is pretty small. Um, uh, so it, it would have been, di I mean, I, I don't know your personal history, of course, but it would have been pretty difficult for the GP to have predicted uh, uh, the outcome uh, from HRT in, a, in an individual. We know from a population level what the risk is, but to predict it in one person is quite difficult, actually. But surely, if, if they read your, your history, your family history, which they sh should be on, it was on all my information that I was susceptible, my family and history and everything. Sure. You know, mm. she never said to me, oh, well, there's a, you know, she just said to me, well, there's a slight risk that it could give you a stroke, I would never have taken it. Yeah, yeah. But she said, you know, you just yeah. have to read, read the, the leaflet. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So, just the back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What, what do you think are the most promising developments 
that can apply to speeding up the diagnosis of cause of stroke at the point when the, the stroke happens, so in that blue light phase. Yeah. Is there any promising research in that area? Yes, yeah, so, so, so th there, there, there is research that we're doing and there's stuff that's already happened now. And l let me just tell you about the stuff that's already happened because that's easier to give. So, and this is, the, Germany is leading the way here. Uh, one of the, the things that you will all know about is that we've got to get patients into hospital pretty quickly once they've had the symptoms of stroke. And one of the delays in getting the patient uh, to the clock busting drug is having to do a brain scan. And so the patient comes in and then we spend half an hour sort of faffing around trying to find a porter to get the patient to a, you know, the fourth floor and the lift doesn't work so that, you know, that's where the scanner is and so on. Um, so one of the things that Germany has done is that they've created uh, ambulances, larger ambulances with a scanner built inside. So it's a mobile scanner come ambulance unit. And whilst they're spending the 20 minutes getting the patient to hospital, they're actually scanning the patient simultaneously. So by the time the patient gets into hospital, they, they've already, they, they, you, you, the patient comes with their own scan uh, already so that we don't have that 20 minute delay. So that saves time. And, this, and although, I, uh, although I say and all the, the media coverage says get the patient into hospital in four and a half hours, actually four and a half hours, to be honest, is too late. The, all the studies suggest that the faster you give clot busting drugs, really in the first 30 minutes or an hour, it's by far the better outcome. You can, it's safe to carry on giving up to four and a half hours, but the outcomes are much better if you give it within 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. So every minute is, is, does count. So that's one thing that's already now happening, and, and there is a pro prospect of introducing that in the UK as well, particularly in rural areas. Not so much a problem in, in the cities like London and Nottingham, but in rural areas it might be more, more appropriate. One of the things that we, we've, we've done, and I presented this, I think, at the annual conference of different strokes last, last year, was that uh, it's difficult to diagnose a stroke on the bedside uh, because the scans normally, the CT scan is normally normal. And the only point of doing a scan when a patient has a stroke is to make sure they're not having a bleed. Because if they're having a bleed, then we don't want to give clot-busting drugs. But the scan isn't sensitive enough to pick up the stroke, the ischemic stroke, the clotting stroke that's about to occur or that is occurring. You have to wait 24 hours to pick that one up. So we do the scan not to diagnose the stroke. We do the scan to make sure we're not missing a bleed so that we can carry on doing what we think. But that does mean that we don't really have a test for stroke. You get some chap like me comes along, looks at a normal scan and then sees the patient half paralyzed, thinks, yeah, it looks like a stroke, sounds like a stroke, let's give the clot busting drug. Mm -hmm. But it might not be a stroke, it might be something else, it might be epilepsy, it might be you know, complicated migraine, it could be anything. But we take a guess, uh, I mean obviously we're experienced, so it's not blind guess, but we, <laughs> we, 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 we are essentially guessing in the absence of having a test. Now, the heart doctors would say to you, oh, these neurologists are terrible. The heart doctors, we've got a blood test. It's called troponin. We can, diagnose a stro we can diagnose a heart attack by doing a blood test at the bedside, and we know then it's a positive, and then we can go in and do all our fancy stuff that cardiologists do. So we've never had that blood test. So one of the things that my group has done is that we've, done, uh, we've looked at all the proteins in, uh, in a human body and we've analysed all those proteins in patients that have had a stroke or, uh, have had, or are having a stroke, I should say, within the first 24 hours and then compared those proteins three months later in the same individual. And what we found after lots of tests and, you know, after three years of research, what we found were well, there were the three proteins that uh, changed in the presence of an ongoing stroke. Two of them went up, one of them went down which is perfect because you don't want everything to go up because then you get a bit worried. So you've got two going up, one going down, and they all go back to normal uh, uh, a couple of months later. But that does mean that within the first few hours, those three proteins change. And now what we're trying to do is develop a bedside test for those three proteins, a bit like a BM stick. You know when diabetics just prick their finger and you get a little stick in and it changes from you know, green to blue or something. So we're trying to develop that kind of test so that we can look at those three proteins immediately by the bedside, and then just like the heart doctors, we can stand up and say, although my scan's normal, look, I've got a little test that's gone from green to red to show that this person is really having a stroke, and now I can give clot-busting drugs and take the risk of all the side effects of clot-busting drugs because I'm really sure this person's paralysis is due to a stroke and not due to something else. 
oh yes, we can do lots of things for people that have bleeds. So one of the commonest reasons why people have bleeds, or at least the bleeds getting worse when they're coming into us, is that they have really high blood pressure. So we can get the blood pressure down. And also, we've now got drugs that have come onto the market in the last, I think, three years or so, that actually clot the bleed that's going on. So everything that I've been talking about is trying to, uh, trying to thin the blood down, whereas with the bleeds, we've got now drugs that can actually cause clotting, because we want clotting to occur so it blocks off the bleeding uh, source. And we have those drugs, and they work on the clotting pathway, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're quite effective, actually. So yes, we can do that. Seventy-five now. Right. So, so the reason your aspirin's been going down gradually is because if you had a bleed, then they don't want to take the risk of giving you a blood thinning drug because if uh, because you're at higher risk of having a bleed again. So that means that they don't want to take that risk of making a potential new bleed worse. So that's why they're reducing it down. But you make an interesting comment about statins. You said you didn't want to talk about the statins, but statins are really interesting, actually, because there's a lot of research that's been going on with statins. And if you read the Daily Mail, you, 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 you get two views from the Daily Mail. One day, the headline will be, oh, we're all dying because we're all taking statins. They're terrible drugs. And the next day, it'll be, oh, the miracle drug is statins, OK? And actually, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story because in the stroke world and in the heart world, the evidence suggests, you give statins to reduce people's cholesterol, okay, and that's, that's why they were developed. But actually, all the evidence suggests that after you've had a stroke or a heart attack, that it doesn't matter what your cholesterol is. Even if your cholesterol is plum normal, if we give statins, it still reduces your chance of having a heart attack and stroke. And that's because they have additional properties than just reducing your cholesterol. And so when, when I suggest to patients uh, or, or the GPs of patients that, you know, you should give this patient a statin, usually the response I get is, oh, but my cholesterol's normal, I don't need it. So then I spend another 20 minutes explaining that actually, it doesn't, I'm, not, I'm not interested in what the cholesterol is. I'm not giving it to reduce cholesterol because they have other uh, uh, properties such as anti-inflammatory properties which are protecting the patient from stroke and heart disease. And that's why strokes and heart attacks, by the way, by the way, occur more in November and December and January than they do in the summer. And, and everybody used to think, oh, well, they don't occur in the summer because everybody goes away in, for, to the south of France, so all the strokes occurring in the south of France, everybody's on holiday. <laughs> so that, that used to be the reason why the hospitals were always empty in the summer in the winter crisis, because everybody says, oh, well, there's no one in the country, everybody's left the country. But actually, what, what research has found recently is that stroke is, and heart disease are an inflammatory condition, inflammation. And when you get more inflammation is when you've got viruses. When you get more viruses, you get them in the winter. And that's why strokes and heart attacks occur more in the winter. And statins, because they're anti-inflammatory, they actually protect people from having a stroke, irrespective of what your cholesterol is. Yeah. Oh, of course they have side effects, yeah, but they're very rare side effects. They're overblown, the side effects in the press, actually. They're very rare. They're very well-tolerated drugs, yeah. I had one of the lowest cholesterol levels in the whole practice, and two weeks later, I had the stroke. <laughs> so, did, so did, did you take the statins? No, no. It's, yeah. So, so, so they would have said, "Oh well, you have got such good cholesterol, you don't need the statin." Yeah. But the, my argument is, I don't care what your cholesterol is. In fact, to be honest, I could I could stand here and, and quite conceivably argue reasonably confidently that I don't even need to measure people's cholesterol because once they've had a heart attack or stroke, they should be on a statin, whatever their cholesterol is. And the only reason I measure it is because I want to make sure it's not so high that I need to increase the dose to much higher levels. So that's why I'm measuring the cholesterol, is to determine the dose, not to determine whether they should be on it or not. Okay, so uh, the reason I check cholesterol is to determine what dose I should prescribe, not whether I should prescribe it or not. So. Hello. I'd like to add to the, the question of the, the bleed type. Um, I had a bleed stroke 10 years ago. Um, the one problem is 
prevention in the first place. It's not for you, it's more for GPs. Um, two years before my stroke, I had my blood test, and it was very bit high, but not horrible. So my, my GP said, um, your blood, blood pressure is a bit, bit too high, but um, can we dealt with? Um, you've got a choice, take the pills or to go to the gym. I said, oh, well, I'll go to the gym, I'll put that to the gym, two, uh, two pills. So I did just that, so I go to the gym, worked hard, and of course it tailed off, try again, tailed off, tried again, had a big beat stroke. I basically said, if that GP had said, um, take the pills and blood go to the gym as well, you know, have to do both, might have saved my life, but uh, you know, well, my, my stroke rather, but um, yeah, just a general thing. More, more, the real question was, um, look back to the thrown back to me, um, it sounds very good stuff, but um, I can imagine those, those um, little um, tubes must be pre pretty tiny. Um, do you have to cho choose um, which patients can actually take it? Like, are, there, are there, um, yeah. their arteries okay and not, not too brittle or something? Right, right. So, so, so the tubes uh, that we put in to take the clot out uh, are pretty small tubes. They're not quite the size of hairs, but they're pretty tiny little tubes. And we don't really need to change the tube size for individual patients. It's not that if someone's a large patient, we need a larger tube, because the blood vessels really are all the same in the size in all of us. But what we do tend to do is look at the scans of the angiogram that we've done before we do the study, and we see whether the blood vessels have got sharp turnings or not. Because if they've got sharp turnings to get to, from the groin, which is where we go in to get to the brain, if they've got lots of sharp turnings, then we need to use a more flexible tube. And if they don't have so many sh turnings and it's a more straighter access, or the road is a bit straighter, then we can use a slightly stiffer tube. So it's not the size of the tube that counts, really. It's kind of like the flexibility of the tube. And that d just depends on the general makeup of the individual, wh what kind of tortuosity, the tubing uh, 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 narrowness and the, and the number of turns that they've got. Supporting what you were saying about um, co um, t to lower cholesterol, what they called? Uh, statins. Statins. Uh, two or three years ago, my husband um, was on statins and he hadn't been on them for very long. And I th in the early hours of the morning, I thought he'd had a stroke, all the symptoms of a stroke. It turned out that um, it was the statin that had given these um, the symptoms. symptoms. Right. Um, and our doctor changed them to, I think, a newer one, mm. just as effective, but a much lower dose. Mm. And um, he, he still did have some of the symptoms afterwards. I mean, they sent him for the brain scan and everything. But... Um, I would say we have a lot of confidence in our doctor. He's excellent. Mm. Um, and he was saying to my husband only a, a couple of weeks ago, even if you still take one once a week, once a month, it is beneficial. Yep. So um, really that is supporting what you are saying, take your statins. Yeah, I, I would take them. In fact, I'm, in all my years, and I'm older than I look, in all my years, I, I've not come across a patient whose stroke symptoms could be put down to statins, to be honest. I suspect uh, st statins do have side effects. The side effects tend, the commoner side effects tends to be ache in the muscles, to be honest. And uh, aches in the muscle, you know, I get aches, you know, I'm getting aches in my leg standing here for 45 minutes, but so that you can't put that down to statins. So, so we, do, we do tend to assign a lot of side effects unnecessarily uh, to statins when they're not really the guilty, guilty drug. But we've got lots of different statins, so we can always replace them with something else. Uh, so, but there's no question that all the research, and there's been tons and tons of research in statins, the, the balance of benefit is much greater than the balance of any harm or risk. Yeah. Hi. Um, I had a stroke when I was 29, so obviously quite a young stroke survivor now. But my um, diagnosis was very delayed because of my age. And I was too young to have had a stroke. It was migraine, it was a urine infection, other things, until I couldn't speak. And then everything was very delayed. I had speech therapy for a year after. But do you think younger people are being put at risk and miss the opportunity to have thrombolysis because they are being just sort of pushed aside due to their age rather than... Right, no, so, so, so absolutely not. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that the management of stroke has, has revol been revolutionised in the last decade, and irrespective of the age that you are, 
you get the same management. There's no, no question about that. And I'm, I work in one of the largest growth units in the country in central London. And uh, uh, we see the, the complete range uh, from, you know, 16-year-olds to 100-year-olds. And I think the oldest person that we thrombolized gave clot-busting drugs to currently I think is 97 or 95 when we, uh, we thrombolize that patient. So age is not a restrictive factor. And the youngest person we, we've thrombolized, I think, is about 19 or 20, something like that. As a last note, to any of you who don't know your blood pressure, you can have it tested in the rest and relaxation room. We have a break coming up now. Thank you. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you remember nothing else from this talk, just remember the three causes of stroke, which you can prevent right now. OK, the three causes, and I always end with this, I apologise if you're bored to death with this, but three causes of stroke that you have to remember if you remember nothing else, and that's high blood pressure, high blood pressure, and high blood pressure. Okay? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.